Okay, I think we can get started. Welcome to our 1.30 press conference, uh, which we've entitled The Battle of Fire and Ice, New Re Scientific Results from Comet Ison. And uh, we have five speakers in this order. Carl Battams, he's, Comet Ison, he's with the Comet Ison Observing Campaign. He's from the Naval Research Lab in Washington, D.C. Alfred McEwen, he's the principal investigator for High Rise on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. He's from the University of Arizona in Tucson. We have Ralph McNutt. He's project scientist for Messenger. He's with John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland. Geraint Jones. Geraint Jones um, he's with UCL Mullard Space Science Laboratory and the Center for Planetary Sciences at University College London in Birkbeck, UK. And last speaker will be Dean Pesnell. He's a project scientist for the Solar Dynamics Observatory. He's at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Use this. Okay, good afternoon. I'm going to go fairly quickly through this so that we get plenty of time for questions if there are any. But basically, I think most people kind of know the history of Comet Ison. The important points about ISON is when it was discovered in September of last year, it was very, very distant from us. And it's one of the furthest kind of out that we've discovered a comet. And it was very bright considering how far out it was. And so that immediately caught our attention. Of course, once we figured out the orbit of the comet, we realized that ISON came from the Oort cloud, so it's a dynamically new object outside the solar system. It had never been into the solar system before. It was also a sun-grazing comet, which means it's gonna, it went extremely close to the sun. And the important point there is that we've never seen an Oort cloud sun-grazing comet before. And ordinary comets, when they get fairly close to the sun, their ices start to boil away and vaporize. With sun-grazing comets, when they get close to the sun, everything boils away and vaporizes. So that's a really important point to note about ISON. It was a very, it was unprecedented object. So we had the Comet ISON observing campaign ongoing. We've had hundreds, really, of amateur astronomers, pro-am astronomers, professionals. They've been making some fabulous observations of Comet ISON. Uh, we've also had 13 different um, space-based observations of Comet ISON. So we had a, a whole range of planetary and heliophysics and astrophysics missions, rocket launch, several other missions that attempted to see ISON. They didn't actually succeed. Some of the more interesting results, like we had an amateur astronomer in September that was able to obtain a ground-based spectrum of the comet. That's a, a wonderful observation for an amateur astronomer to make. We've had the astrophotographers like Damien Peach, Michael Yeager. They've been producing some fantastic images that show us the morphology of the comet, the shape in the tail. A huge amount of information that comes from those observations. But my personal um, domain is the heliophysics satellites. So that's the stereo satellite, and or satellite, sorry, there's two of them, and the SOHO satellite. And the point I want to make um, the point to keep in mind about the stereo satellites is that they're on the opposite side of the solar system from Earth. So SOHO is basically at Earth, but the stereo satellites are on the, on the opposite side. So they get a completely different perspective of Comet ISON. This movie, I think most people have seen this by now, but this is ISON coming in in the Lasco C3 field of view. We see it, it gets very bright in the hours leading up to perihelion, about 12 or so hours before perihelion, then it very quickly fades away. Afterwards, what emerges is basically just a dust cloud. And certainly when ISON flew into the sun, when we saw that the brightness was diminishing quickly before it even reached perihelion, this definitely made us nervous. When we saw the dust cloud that come out, that made us extremely nervous. Image here from the Stereo A satellite. So again, like I said, this is on the other side of the solar system now. So it's seeing comet from a different direction. ISON flies past the sun. We get a slightly better view of the way that the dust cloud is kind of pushed out. And Grain's going to talk more about the, the dust tail modeling. But again, it's exactly the same thing we saw. It looks somewhat comet-like going in. It looks somewhat dust cloud-like coming out. 
This is uh, an observation from the Soho Suma instrument. This was taken right at perihelion in the minutes surrounding perihelion. And Suma is an ultraviolet spectrometer. And what it's looking at is um, Lyman alpha. And without getting technical, basically, it's the interaction of, of sunlight and hydrogen. And on this slide, the white crosses are actually where the comet's nucleus and coma should be. And then the kind of the colorful thing you see, that's the tail of the comet. The important thing about this observation is that they, may, they could not detect any Lyman alpha at the nucleus or the, the coma that was within their detection threshold. All they saw was Lyman alpha in the tail of the comet, and they believe that that's basically just reflected. That's not even um, from cometary material. What this tells us is it looks like even at perihelion there may not have been any activity or any significant activity from an active nucleus at that time. And this observation is supported by the SOHO SWAN instrument which also looks at Lyman Alpha and that basically saw the comet just disappear off the grid right at perihelion. Finally, very quickly, um, we love this movie. This is the heliospheric imager on the Stereo A satellite. We see Comet Ison coming in, that's the brighter of the two comets. It's just now passing by Comet Enki. We've got Earth in the center of the field of view, Mercury to the upper left. Now what we're going to see here is Ison is actually going to disappear into the sun. So right now it's, it's going around the sun. And then if you watch in the upper right hand corner of the movie, in just a moment, out comes Comet Ison again, that dusty streak that's moving out. And unfortunately, this, this is the most recent movie we have. It's only a few couple of days old and ISON is basically gone at this point. NASA is going to try and look for it with Hubble, and I've heard that Spitzer and Chandra may be attempting observations as well. Um, that really is sort of, a, sort of a recovery mission, but I don't know if we're going to get any success with those. And at this point, I will pass over to Alfred. Okay, well, I'm going to address one question. How big was ISON? And back in around October 1 of this year, it made a relatively close pass to Mars, about 11 million kilometers. And that's about a factor of 60 closer to Mars than it ever came to Earth. So uh, we were actually able to get the best constraint on its diameter from Mars. And uh, said that. So we have a nice little uh, camera uh, on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, be, be a half meter diameter this would be a pretty good backyard telescope. It is the biggest telescope sent to another planet. Uh, but we have very specialized electronics that run hot in order to image Mars at very high resolution. So we, we're quite limited in our exposure times. It's not well designed then to image the uh, faint coma. But we did observe it. And uh, I have the unusual experience of showing you high-rise images that aren't spectacular looking, but um, <laughs> They're actually quite useful. The fact that the coma wasn't very active uh, actually helps us to, in the constraint on the uh, size of the nucleus. And uh, the earlier images at lower phase angles were, were the most useful. Uh, this shows these four images in the red band pass here. Definitely detected it. Uh, so how can we constrain the size of the nucleus? We didn't resolve it, so we can't directly measure it. Uh, however, uh, it, the brightness that we see within a three by three pixel area to encompass all of the signal from a point source um, can be used to model the size as a function of the reflectivity of the comet itself, the phase function, how it varies in brightness with phase angle, and also uh, how much of the signal comes from the nucleus rather than from the coma. Uh, with a three by three pixel area, the, the, the uh, nucleus is much less than 1% of that area. So we're definitely getting signal from the coma, even though it was faint. Uh, this gives us a, a family of solutions. This plot shows diameter versus albedo. And three plots depend uh, for uh, percent signal from the nucleus. The extremes of this plot are highly unlikely. Um, if it was extremely dark, it probably wasn't anywhere close to 100% of the signal. Uh, the lower limits there are, are unlikely because comets are generally very dark, and the uh, gas escape rates give some constraint on its minimum size. 
But, but uh, reasonably, it could be anywhere from 100 to 1,000 meters diameter based on, on this plot, and more likely somewhere in the middle. So um, one of the questions is just how bright was the nucleus here? Uh, we've seen uh, up close short period comets and measured the albedo, but these are comets that have passed the sun, the inner solar system many times and experience the, the sublimation uh, that goes with that. ISON was making its first visit to the inner solar system, so we, we can't assume we knew how bright it was. We probably detected signal from the coma, substantial signal. So it was probably smaller than maybe 600 meters diameter, and uh, from past sun grazing comets, those smaller than about half a kilometer typically don't survive. So if it was smaller than half a kilometer, that's, that's a reasonable possibility, then it's not surprising that it didn't survive. Okay, next year, next October, we have another comet to look at called Sighting Springs. This one will pass much closer to Mars, uh, and, and high rise will get 140 meters per pixel. So we will resolve this unless it's extremely tiny. Uh, and this will be our first resolved image of a long period comet. All of the other images that we have seen up close, the nucleus have been short period comets. So, so this will help answer questions about how long period comets like ISON differ from short period comets. So stay tuned for next year. And who's up next? There you go. In. Uh, Ralph. So what I wanted to talk about were some of the observations that we made with from the MESSENGER spacecraft. And uh, MESSENGER, of course, is in orbit around the planet Mercury. Uh, we've been there in orbit for, uh, for quite a while, since March of 2011. But uh, we we're very well placed for being able to look uh, both at ISON as well as at Enki. Uh, during their passages through the inner part of the solar system. And using the cameras on board as well as the ultraviolet invisible spectrometer, we've been able to get some interesting data on ISON in this part of the heliosphere. So uh, what this, this, uh, these two photographs show are uh, variations that you can actually see in the, uh, in the light output coming from ISON. These were both taken on November the 16th taken about uh, 21 hours apart using the wide-angle camera on board uh, MESSENGER. And there is certainly a difference in the brightening of the, of the comet over that short period of time. Now, one of the things that we did was to actually put together an overall campaign of looking, of taking quite a few different images uh, of ISON uh, near its closest approach to Mercury and, and therefore the MESSENGER spacecraft. And I'll say a little bit more of that. I, I should mention that we actually haven't seen all of that data yet because some of the, sp some of the data is still on board the spacecraft because of low data downlinks, uh, downlink rates. So uh, we've still got a little bit of, uh, a little bit of, the, uh, of the story that's still uh, playing out uh, even as I speak. Uh, let me just switch over and, and show you what some of the ultraviolet and visible spectrometer data look like. This is with a, an instrument that was actually built by the Laboratory for Astrophysics and Space Physics, uh, Space Science at um, the, the University of Colorado at Boulder at LASP. Uh, we, overall, we took about 9,000 spectral scans of ISON uh, over 15 different wavelength ranges and about 30 hours of observations. And on the right-hand side, this shows one of the spectra. You can see that there are various spectral lines. These are emission lines that are characteristic of things coming off of the comet. Uh, the C refers to carbon. There's a lot of carbon that was coming off of ISON. The O refers to an oxygen line at 1,304 or 1,305 angstroms. And on the left-hand side, there's a corresponding spectrum of the comet Enki. And you can see the oxygen line is there but all of these other lines are not. And of course, Enki is this short period comet that is old, and ISON is the long period comet that was new coming in. So we've already been able to actually discern some of the differences between the two in looking at these differences in these two spectra. You can also see uh, that there are, we think, some carbon monoxide bands. The S refers, of course, to, to sulfur. Uh, there's some other carbon lines. 
And then we believe that there are also in some of the other spectral scans that we made that I haven't shown here, uh, things have shown up such as sodium, some other of the, the dimers involving uh, carbon and nitrogen. So it's actually a very rich data set, and we've only just started to look, at, to look through that. And finally, I just wanted to say that with respect to the, um, with respect to the overall campaign looking at the, uh, the photometry, uh, we actually made 100 uh, pictures of ISON using the narrow angle camera on board Messenger. Uh, these were done in groups of 20, and this is the second of the, uh, this is the second group of the five groups that were made. And as you can watch across here, this is, these were made at about uh, something like about uh, a 30 minute cadence between individual images. And so you can already see that there are variations in the brightness uh, between the individual frames. And so we're, uh, we're, like I say, we're still in the process of getting data down uh, from the spacecraft on the ground and uh, we'll have, uh, hopefully have a nice little movie of about 100 frames in it that uh, will be ready um, to make the round sometime after we get all the data down. Thanks, so good afternoon everyone. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some initial uh, analysis of the, of the data that uh, Carl showed at the beginning of the, of the session uh, from the LASCO and, and SECI instruments on SOHO and, and stereo. And um, we can basically tell already that uh, the, the comet stopped being active at perihelion and uh, I'll just briefly outline how we, uh, how we can tell that. So were we foolhardy uh, to hope that uh, Comet Ison would survive perihelion? Not at all. Almost exactly two years ago, there was a Comet Lovejoy, uh, not to be confused with the Comet Lovejoy you can see in the sky at the moment, found by Terry Lovejoy on its way in, which passed very close to the sun, a little more than a tenth of the distance from the, the sun's surface that uh, Comet Ison passed uh, from the sun uh, this year. And so, as you can see from this image, this was taken after perihelion for, for Comet Lovejoy, and it had uh, passed the sun. You can see part of its tail actually just on the left of the image, and uh, a new dust tail had formed as the comet moved away from the sun. It did fragment after this, uh, but it appears that it, it did survive perihelion and came out the other side. So, uh, how do we interpret the activity level of, of comets from looking at uh, images of them? A, a dust tail is basically reflected sunlight. And what you're seeing is, uh, a, when you look at a comet tail, is a distribution of particles of different ages and different sizes. So this is an image uh, from uh, one of the first images, actually, from the Secchi instruments on stereo when it switched on in early 2007 of uh, Comet McNaught. And the, the comet here is moving towards the left in this image. The sun is basically uh, downwards. Uh, in red there, you can see where Niwa dust is, closest to the head of the comet. That's been released most recently. And then at the other end of the tail, you've got older dust uh, that was released um, longer ago. At the edge of the tail that's nearest to the sun, we've got large dust. Now, all these dust particles are uh, prone to, to radiation pressure. And that's basically uh, the effect of sunlight uh, pushing the dust away from the sun. So uh, gravity. Uh, pulls the dust towards the sun, but radiation pressure can uh, exert a force in the opposite direction. So generally, the smaller the dust, the more easy it is to push away from the, from the sun. So the, the part of the tail that's furthest from the sun uh, is basically where you see the smaller dust. So in 1968, Finson and Probstein had a, a model where they first proposed that you can look at dust tails to figure out uh, how the activity of, of um, comets changed. So here's a, a, a fit, a Finson probe line fit to, uh, to the dust tail of, of Comet Ison. So this is taken from Stereo A uh, on the other side of the sun from the Earth, more or less. And you can see uh, Comet Ison at the top there with the sun's disk um, covered and the circle showing the size of the dust. And then on the, on the right, you can see uh, a model fit. This mesh shows uh, different ages going the different ages of dust going from uh, pink through blue to green, and uh, also um, forming the mesh is the uh, different uh, sizes of the particles. So this is for the same time, and assuming that the, the comet had uh, continued to be active during perihelion. Now you can see quite clearly there's a, there's a big difference between the two. So in the image on the left, you can see that uh, the dust tail 
is pointing up towards the roughly the two o'clock position. Um, but on the right, if you look at the model, if the, if the comet had continued producing dust, then the newest part of the dust tail would have been pointing more or less north away from the, from the sun, and we just don't see that part of the dust tail. Um, so in the, in the mesh, you can see there's a little bulge um, to the upper right of the, of the nucleus, and that corresponds to the time when it reached perihelion. So um, it looks like dust production more or less stopped when the comet reached perihelion. And if we apply the same thing um, to, uh, to a view from SOHO, so very similar to the view we would have got from Earth if we could have seen ISON at the time, again, a uh, similar model, you can see the, uh, the dust viewed from, from this viewpoint, uh, the tail is pointing towards the upper left. But if it had continued releasing dust after perihelion, um, we would have seen a bright part of the dust tail pointing uh, straight north. So uh, this prelim preliminary analysis shows already that it's quite clear that the dust production of ISON stopped uh, more or less at, uh, at perihelion. And uh, as Carl was saying earlier, the, the comet continued to fade uh, after uh, perihelion uh, as it moved away from the sun. But uh, for those of you who were watching what was going on during the time of perihelion, it was a bit puzzling in the uh, hour or two after, after the comet passed close to the sun that it did uh, re-brighten briefly. And um, so how could that have occurred? Well, one possible uh, explanation, or at least uh, part of the picture that might help um, why, to explain why that rebrightening occurred is that uh, fragmentation occurred uh, before the nucleus reached perihelion. So as the comet was coming in towards the sun, uh, you can see the, um, the white disk there at lower left. That's the nucleus. It breaks up into lots of pieces which travel more or less together. Uh, and then as they approach the sun, the, the chunks of the nucleus closest or leading uh, the cloud of, of fragments speeds up first and uh, the whole cloud stretches out. So at perihelion, instead of all being a tightly bunched cloud of fragments, they're all stretched out over uh, uh, the orbit. And then coming out the other side, on the right-hand side, um, the, the speeds of the fragments all slow down and they start to bunch up together. So that might explain why uh, the comet uh, rebrightened at least briefly after, after perihelion. But we'll have to model this in more detail over the, over the coming months to understand fully what, uh, what happened at the time. Okay, so I'll pass on to Dean. Yeah. All right, thanks. Uh, I'm Dean Pesnell, and I'm going to speak about uh, what we didn't see in SDO uh, as Comet Ison went by. Uh, when Comet Ison was discovered a little over a year ago, uh, the SDO science teams decided that this would be an excellent opportunity to try and observe a sun grazing comet. Uh, we had already seen Comet Lovejoy, we had seen an earlier comet as well, and what we have realized is these sun-grazing comets provide information about the sun as well as provide inform information about the uh, early solar system. So we drew up this little graphic that tried to put all our unknowns and our uncertainties together. Uh, would it break up? Uh, how, how does it evaporate, both the ice co component and the, the dust grains that come off? Um, we thought that the important thing was the visibility, how bright it would be. Uh, we had Comet Lovejoy as an excellent example, um, so we used that to develop our models and we said, you know, it's probably going to be bright enough to see. Uh, we were certain enough that we put together what we call an SDO data event where we take advantage of SDO's unique downlink capability and provide the data to the public as fast as we can. And we actually are able to take images of the sun, send them to the ground, put them through the processing pipeline, and, and actually make them available for the public to look at within 10 to 15 minutes or so after they're being taken. And we have found this is actually fairly popular with the public. We give them the opportunity to um, find the comets in the images. And we've done several things like this. It's been fairly popular, and this looked like a good time to do another one. Um, so. We got together on Thanksgiving Day. On the left is, uh, is an image from near perihelion. There's a thin line in that image that shows the path of the comet. On the right is a movie. It's actually the same uh, wavelength of light, but uh, Barbara Thompson was processing the images, trying to, to bring the tail of the comet out. 
and that little marker, the little cross that's moving along, is the position of the comet as, uh, as time goes on. And if you look at that image very carefully, and we've looked at a lot of these images very carefully, um, we don't see very, we don't see any signal. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we've all been trying to figure out how to find dim signals in these images. Uh, here is simply another uh, image, a different wavelength. Uh, we don't see light scattered off of dust grains or ice or anything. We actually see uh, oxygen atoms that have electrons stripped off of them, so they become ions. And we see different classes of ions that correspond to temperature, but for us, they also depend on how long they've been liberated from the comet. The ones that we saw before take a little while longer, and the ones that we have in this picture would have been shorter, so we looked here to see we, were we just missing some of the, the chemistry. And if you go in and take a look at each image and take the difference of that image from this one here, you would see a line if there was a comet visible in, that, in the new image. And there is that difference image, and once again, we don't see a line. And this is very sensitive test, and I'll show later today how nice, how, how sensitive um, this method is to picking out trails in um, a set of images. Um, now on the right, we have our, our movie from Comet Lovejoy. Uh, at the very, where, where it starts up on the left, those conditions are similar to what we expected from Comet Ison. It's a little bit closer into the sun, but it's far enough away that the, the conditions are such that we should have seen a signal kind of like that. It actually lasts a long time. We see a signal out there lasting a half hour or so. Um, so we expected with the long exposures that we could uh, take by building our images up that we would see a, an image from Comet Ison. And as a result of the analysis that we've done, we can only conclude that there's not enough stuff coming off the comet. And there's a variety of things that we can use to explain that. But what we have here is just not enough things being left along the comet for us to see. Uh, we thought, the, the, on the other hand, the public event was a great success. We had a lot of people come in. We got a lot of good questions about comets and solar physics. So we think that the, the fact that we, we reached out to the public to help us look was, was good. And uh, we were very happy to have done that. And we hope that another sun grazing comet comes along um, that we can try again. So thank you. Go for questions. First, let me check one thing. Is there anyone um, on the telephone from remote sites? Yes. OK. Can you identify yourself, please? Seth Bornstein, the Associated Press. OK. Seth, do you have any questions? Yes, forgive me because I was having some technical issues here. Um, can you explain why ISON, what is it about ISON that made it not survive compared to Lovejoy and other sun grazers that do survive? Okay, this is Carl Battams here from Naval Research Lab. Um, there's a bunch of factors, but Basically, it fell apart. And why did it fall apart? Well, um, it's an Oort cloud comet. Comet Lovejoy was not an Oort cloud comet. It was one that had been through past the sun at least a couple of times. So it had perhaps built up sort of a, a thick skin, so to speak, sort of a, a toughened exterior. It, it had been heat treated, for want of a better word. Maybe that's a factor. Uh, because Ison was an Oort cloud comet, that makes it potentially extremely volatile and quite likely it just, as it got close to the sun, it was stretched and pulled by the sun, the solar radiation got into it and it just fell apart. And we also don't know the size of ice on. I mean, we've heard about the, the size range, but if it's down towards the lower end of the estimates, it could actually also be a little smaller than uh, Comet Lovejoy was. And if so, then certainly that, that doesn't bode for it well at all. But it's, I mean, it's not entirely clear to us. This is the problem with comets. We can't definitely predict based on the, the size of a comet and how close it gets to the sun. We still can't say, yes, this comet will survive. No, it won't survive. It's still kind of a, a fuzzy 
little territory there. So it's, it's difficult to answer that. And just one follow-up for me is, um, which, are, which is the more likely, uh, more common scenario, a comet surviving or a comet falling apart? Um, I guess in terms of sun grazing comets, um, more likely they fall apart or completely vaporized because we've seen a couple of thousand sun grazing comets in the SOHO images and um, Lovejoy is the closest we've come to seeing one survive and that only made, that made it a couple of days past before falling apart. So um, yeah, pretty much overwhelmingly um, sun grazers have a really hard time of life. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alex Witsey with Nature. I want to ask about the dust tail modeling. Can you talk a little bit more about um, the brightening pre-perihelion? I understood the, when it fragmented, and is it when you have the fragments stretch out more, there's more, I don't know, area to reflect? Like, what is the brightening? Um, like, why is it brighter when it, they're all stretched out? Um, well, the, um, so, after perihelion, in a couple of hours after perihelion, uh, looking at the images coming down, um, it looked as if the comet had been lost when it was at its closest to the, uh, that it had fully fragmented. Um, but there was uh, a period of about an hour or two when it brightened up again, which was really puzzling. And um, as I said, this is just an initial suggestion, but maybe uh, the, initially it was a cloud of, of fragments and dust traveling more or less together. As it got closer and closer to the sun, everything was speeding up, but the part of the, the, the cloud leading sped up first, and then it all stretched out, as you can see in the, in the cartoon there. Uh, so the sunlight reflecting over that stretched out cloud made it appear less bright briefly. Like yeah, like a slinky, that's a good suggestion, Carl. Yeah. That's right, and then orbital dynamics and coming out the other side, it all started to bunch up together. Uh, but any large fragments that existed before then probably had broken up into dust. But as it all came together again into a cloud on the other side, it briefly rebrightened. Um, so that's, uh, I think, um, the possibly an explanation for it. There are other uh, aspects as well that uh, the phase angle was changing. So um, that's the, the line from the sun to the comet to the Earth was changing, that angle. And the way that dust reflects sunlight changes as well with that angle. So as it was on the, when it reached perihelion, it was on the far side of the sun as seen from Soho, where it would have appeared a little fainter as well. And then it came back more on, this, on the same side of the, the sun as the Earth, and that could also partially explain the, the rebrightening that, uh, that appeared for a short while. Uh, Steve Benko, Physics Today magazine. Uh, 9,000 spectral scans. <laughs> From, from Messinger, that's a lot of uh, uh, potentially useful compositional information, you know, what the thing is made of. Um, any surprises so far, even though the data is preliminary? And a follow-up question, are there other compositional observations from other spacecraft or things that are in the pipeline? The only one we've heard about today is from Messinger so far. Right. Well, with respect to the with respect to the data set, the data set's quite rich. And actually, uh, uh, Ron Vervak, uh, who couldn't be here today, which is why I'm up here today, uh, was the one that really coordinated and led the campaign and uh, did all the selections of all the scans. And he was also involved with a lot of the ground-based observations as well. So he's he's in the process of recovering and getting some sleep back. Um, so we've really, we've really only just glanced at these. I mean, I think that, the, I think that the, the major thing of interest is how many carbon lines that, are actually, that one actually sees in these, uh, in these spectra that we've looked at so far. There are some uh, spectral structures that uh, have not been identified yet. Uh, the guess is that they probably are uh, groups of, of spectral uh, bands that, again, have to do with carbon. but. It's going to take a little bit more work to try to uh, to try to figure all of that out. So, and like I say, we've got uh, we still do have a lot of the a lot of the images are on board the spacecraft. It's just a it's a time period where that the the downlink geometry is not favorable. But 
The interesting thing is, of course, we're seeing these variations in the, in the brightness, and at the same time, we've got these various spectral scans. So one of the things that we're going, we hope we, we will be able to do is to actually look to see what sort of time variations in the various, uh, the, the, these various uh, spectral lines are, and how that those coordinate with the, with the photometry. And um, I have to ask my other colleagues about other, um, other issues about the, uh, I, well, I guess with, uh, I don't know what you've got on what's available on SOHO and some, and some of the other spacecraft. Um, spectroscopically, not a, not a whole lot. I mean, I mentioned the, the SUMA instrument and SWAN that have been looking in Lyman Alpha. So from those, you can get an idea of water production for the comet, for example. I did hear that um, Venus Express obtained okay. images, but I do not know the nature of their data, so I can't speak to the nature of their data. And certainly we've had observations from Chandra and Spitzer, Hubble, Swift, so there's, um, there's an array of instrumentation there, that, and there's been several press releases about those already. And um, as I also mentioned, we are going to try and do follow-up observations and detect, at least if there's a cloud out there, then try and get a, an image of that cloud. Well, and, and just, just to, just to uh, complete, I mean, the, the thing about Messenger was we were, I think we were definitely in the right place at the right time. It certainly was not by design, and uh, certainly Ron was the one that, uh, that took the initiative about realizing that with us being located in the inner part of the solar system and having this really great instrument on board that the folks at the University of Colorado provided uh, for Messenger, that uh, we were well suited to hopefully do some very interesting science. And I think that, I think that the science is definitely there. And as, as is usually the case with large, rich data sets, it's going to take a time to digest all of it. If, if I could just add something really quickly as well. One exciting thing about this comet apparition as well is the, the amateur contribution. So there have been hundreds of yes. amateurs taking images over the past few weeks as the comet came in. And it was a very dynamic um, comet with changing hourly and uh, we're collating um, images from all these amateurs, and there have been big efforts on social media, which has been a huge success due to the uh, observing campaign. So that'll take a few months to digest as well, as but well. It, should be, yeah. it should be great. Uh, Harvey Leifert, Freelance. A very basic question, I think, for Dr. Betans. Uh, how do we know it came from the Oort cloud, and how do we know it was never in the solar system uh, before? So basically, we, we quite simply look at the, the path that it's following through space. We look at its orbit through space. Once we've calculated that, we know where it is. We know where it's going. And so all we have to do is kind of wind the clock back, see where it came from. And we see that it basically came from way, way, way outside the solar system and essentially on a trajectory right in from the, the Oort cloud. So that's, that's how we know it, it came from out there. and won't have been through the solar system before. I don't get the second part of that. How do we know it was not here before? Well, all cloud comets are not, um, coming from out there, it's not going to be a periodic object. It's going to be a one-pass thing, and they're sort of a, a separate class of comets that we've seen. We know our short period or even long period comets. We can tell the periodic ones, and we can tell the all cloud ones the direction they come in from. Uh, we have a couple questions from um, Tracy Watson from USA Today for Carl. Um, she asks, when precisely did you realize the comet was gone? Did you cherish any hopes after perihelion? And uh, were any observing campaigns canceled after it became clear the comet was gone? Or did every planned observation carry on? So um, there was no definitive moment. It was, kind of a, it was kind of a process of heartbreak, really, that we realized that the... Uh, the the comet was not looking good. I would say a few hours before perihelion, um, myself and my colleague Matthew Knight, we were looking at the images. We've seen a couple of thousand comets in the SOHO images. We know how they behave. We've seen all of these objects vaporize. And when we saw comet ice on start to fade, and then we saw that um, as it was going into the sun, basically it had lost 
any sense of a, a central condensation where the nucleus should be. Instead, it kind of had like a, a very needle-like point at the head of the comet. That's when our alarm bells really went off because we've seen that before and that's, that's never been a good thing in the past. So that definitely got us worried when it came out and it looked like a very dusty streak. I didn't get to show you the Lasco C2 movie because of time constraints, but in that movie, it's a very faint dusty streak that comes out um, that actually fits in very nicely with Geraint's explanation about how the, the, the debris kind of stretches out like a slinky spring during perihelion and then sort of condenses again afterwards. But yeah, it was, I would say probably before perihelion was really when we, um, when we thought that this thing had not made it. And what was the second question again? I'm sorry. Uh, were any observing campaigns cancelled after it oh, became... Um, yeah, I mean, there have been several observing runs that have been um, cancelled because of this. Um, I don't want to speak individually to the observing runs, but there have been a whole bunch of them because obviously there isn't a beautiful object in the night sky now for people to look at, sadly. <laughs> Um, Gabriel Popkin, Science News. I was just curious, um, uh, I reported on ISON earlier and uh, other people did, and the, the figure that was for its size for the, uh, the nucleus that was quoted was not, no more than four kilometers, but certainly it seems like less than one kilometer. With that, to me at least that seems surprising considering the figure we heard from, I guess, the Hubble observation suggested sounded like something larger. So I, I was wondering if that's a surprise to you all that, that now we're looking at less than one kilometer. Well, my, my recollection is that uh, you know, these are very model-dependent estimates, and uh, I believe that might have been an upper limit from Hubble. Uh, and so upper limits are just that. And uh, when you get better data later, it tends to come down, not up. And so that's what happened. Rick Lovett, freelance. Um, I have a, an overall big picture question for this. So when all of this data gets uh, put together, um, what do we hope to learn about the Oort cloud or the sun or comets or wait a minute, what's the bottom line of this? <laughs> well, oh, I mean, one thing I think from, from the difference between Comet Lovejoy two years ago and how ISON behaved is comets are different and the, they're all a diverse family of objects. Some have um, got more ices than others, different types of ices, um, and some are more hardy than others. And you, you saw earlier the, the images of all the different nuclei of comets that have been imaged close up. And they're quite different in uh, shape and composition. Uh, and so I, I think it adds to our collective knowledge of all these uh, of comets and how they're, um, these bodies that have existed from the, the birth of the solar system. Um, <coughs> learning more about each individual one will tell us about the big picture of what the, the, um, the solar system was like during its, its formation. And it's a particularly exciting time for the next year or two as well with uh, the Rosetta mission, European-led mission to um, Comet uh, 67P, Churyumov Grazimenko, that's going to arrive at a comet next year and drop a lander onto a surface. And uh, so it's an exciting time coming up. And I guess I'll just add to, um, to what Grant just said there. Um, we want to we wanna build a picture of how Comet Ison was put together because when we, um, I'm going to steal some lines from my colleague Casey that's sitting in the audience here right now, but when we try and figure out how our solar system was put together, we start with a big load of dust that begins to clump together. And we know ultimately we end up with planets and stars and asteroids and comets and things, but in the middle there, things have got to get stuck together. And um, before you can build a planet, you have to build a comet. And we don't know how comets are built. We, we know how to take very fine dust and make little chunks of rock, little centimeter particles. And we know how to take lots of comets and stick them together and make a planet. But in the middle there, there's a big fuzzy area. We don't know how to take a couple of little rocks, kind of this big, and whack them together at tens of thousands of meters per second or kilometers per second, or whatever, and have them stick together and ultimately form a comet. And so this is why we want to understand 
the composition of these things and hopefully from all the data we got, we'll just learn a little bit more about Comet Iceon, about its composition, elemental abundances, why it fell apart, when it fell apart and why it fell apart at that time. And again, as Grant said, it's just part of, the, uh, part of building the picture. And if I could add just one more thing to what Carl was saying, I mean, one of the things that was sort of interesting about about Messenger, and you saw the uh, you saw Inky going the other the, the uh, short period comet going by in one of the movies, is that we were actually with Messenger and Mercury quite close to Inky, and so while we were actually using the UV instrument to be looking at the spectral lines coming off of Ison, we were doing the same thing with Inky, and I showed the I showed the one example, but we've got that's one of just a lot of, of pieces of data. So I think the other thing, is, as, as everyone else has been saying, I mean, a lot of this has to do with trying to figure out how that the comet zoo gets put together and how many different different creatures that there are in it. And so certainly with, res certainly with respect to, I think, the, the UV results, that once we've had a chance to go through those, because we were able to look at a definitely new comet and a definitely old comet with the same instrument, with the same calibration, at essentially at the same time, we're going to be able to look at those, look at some differentials, and maybe find some things that just hadn't been been expected before, or, or maybe it'll just confirm our suspicions. But uh, it'll take a, it'll take a while to look through that. But it was uh, it was a, a good piece of happenstance that all that came together at once. So I think there's some there's some interesting science to be done still. And I think we have one last question from the chat um, from Seth Borns. Bornstein from the AP for Carl or Dean, um, can you say point blank that Ison is dead? That there's absolutely no hope. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, this is Carl Badham's here. Um, <laughs> oh, wait, wait. It was dead to me. <laughs> okay, it's dead to Dean. Um, yeah. I, um, I think we can say that Comet Ison is dead. There have been a lot of... It's now moving into slightly darker skies. There have been a lot of very um, adept amateur astronomers that have been doing some extremely deep imaging of the region of sky where Comet Ison should be. They've been looking for any kind of nuclear condensation down to about magnitude 16. None of them have recorded anything. And in the, the stereo movie that I had up earlier, that I can, I can flick to as I talk, um, basically we see as, uh, as Comet Ison fades away, as it moves away from the sun, um, you'll just have to wait for the movie to get to the end, but um, as it's moving away, it diffuses really quickly. The limiting magnitude in these images, uh, these are very, very enhanced, and the limiting magnitude is about mag 13 or 14, even as of five or six days ago, the comet was right at the limiting magnitude, and it's, it's just a very broad, diffuse cloud. There is no nucleus, there is no central condensation. Maybe there's a few chunks floating out there, but at this point, um, it seems like there's, there's nothing left. So, um, sorry everyone, but uh, yeah, comet, comet ice on is dead, but its memory will live on. Okay, thank you very much. That concludes this press conference. And thanks very much for your presentations and for everyone else for participating. Our next press conference will be at 4.15. And it's uh, our tornadoes getting stronger.